everybody, and welcome to this hyperlated webinar, uh, which is called the Meeting of Chain Minds. I'm Julian Gordon, the Asia Pacific VP for Hyperledger, and I'm speaking from Hong Kong, and I'm delighted to welcome everyone to this keynote event. Before I introduce you to our distinguished speakers, I'd really like to run through a few housekeeping items. In a second, both Brian and Joe will start the discussion on blockchain, Hyperledger, Ethereum, Bezu, and the future of enterprise blockchain. This will be followed by a Q&A. So please submit your questions. You can see the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we've had hundreds of people who registered for this event. The response has been wonderful. So we won't be able to get everyone's questions, but we're gonna try our best. After the webinar, we will be though sending you all a recording. With that, I'd like to introduce you to our speakers who probably actually don't need any introduction. I'm delighted to say we have Brian Bellendorf, who is joining us from lockdown in his home in the US. Brian is the executive director of Hyperledger. He's a leading figure in blockchain and open source. In 2018, Brian was named one of the top 10 blockchain influencers globally by the New York Times. He was famously the primary developer of the Apache web server and a founding member of the Apache Software Foundation. Brian is on a number of boards, including the Mozilla Foundation and EFF. He has previously held numerous key positions, such as CTO of the World Economic Forum, and the Managing Director at Mistral Capital. With Brian, we are delighted to have Joe Lubin, also joining us from the US. Joe is also a leading global figure in blockchain. He is famous, amongst many things, for being the co-founder of Ethereum and for founding Consensus in 2014, where he is the CEO. Joe has founded several companies. Prior to that, he was at Goldman Sachs and has also founded and managed hedge funds in New York. Joe is an alumni of Princeton University. Finally, Hyperledger and I would like to thank all at Consensus for the support in bringing this event together, together. particularly Charles de Horsey, a director from Consensus who's based here in Hong Kong uh, and in Asia Pacific and his team. Consensus is a primary member of Hyperledger and contributed to its Ethereum client, Bezu, as a project to the Hyperledger community. So thank you, Consensus. Brian and Joe would normally visit Asia Pacific multiple times a year meeting with business and tech leaders and developers across the region. However, with COVID-19, they of course can't currently travel. So instead, they are spending their evening from North America with us virtually. So thank you, stay safe and enjoy the webinar. And over to you, Brian. Thank you, Julian. And um, thank you to everyone who registered and has joined. Um, <clears throat> I took a quick look, quick look over the uh, uh, attendee list uh, that right now, the participant list, and I'm noticing names not just from the Asia Pacific region, which is where this is timed for, um, but, but also in Europe, also in other parts of the United States. And so I appreciate that this is happening at different times, but uh, I, I think this really reflects the global nature of what we're, of what we're doing here on, in Hyperledger, but also in enterprise blockchain technology. Um, certainly these are interesting times to say the least. Um, there are plenty of reasons to wonder, you know, what is the relevancy of enterprise blockchain when it comes to dealing with a pandemic. Uh, other times to, to really think and realize, no, this is perhaps a time that calls for even more investment into and, and, and research into the use of distributed ledgers for supply chain traceability, um, you know, far, tra tracking pharmaceuticals whether, or vaccines perhaps from source to destination. Um, or or other types of finance and, and, and applications that used to require a lot of trust, a lot of face-to-face -face engagement, and now might need to be more touchless, more automated, more distributed. Um, and, uh, and, and especially, I mean, we'll talk about, perhaps about some other specific use cases in COVID-19, but the field of digital identity potentially will be really remade by the times <clears throat> that, that we're in and, and that are called for. Um, and, and as many of you know, at, at Hyperledger, you know, for the last four years, we've had uh, a very much of a, of a greenhouse mentality um, when it comes to, to recognizing that there are many different perspectives on the right way to build distributed ledger technology. Um, that there really is a spectrum uh, uh, out there from uh, very much permissioned blockchains uh, uh, designed to coordinate facilitation between a small or mid-sized number of players all the way to the public blockchain networks, <clears throat> which Bitcoin and Ethereum have been really great examples of the, the power and, and, and the, the technology and, and, the, and the use cases that are possible at that scale. Um, and so while we've had you know, some real clear, clear um, successes coming out of Hyperledger, we're always interested in understanding, are we really covering the full landscape? 
Uh, and as part of that, uh, you know, even very early on in Hyperledger's history, we were paying attention to Ethereum. Um, uh, I, even before joining as a, a executive director of Hyperledger, had met Vitalik uh, and, and others who were in doing their initial uh, fundraise for, for the Ethereum ICO, uh, had gotten to understand that it really was about a different way to build uh, distributed applications and um, and a way to try to get to uh, distributed computing uh, in, in a way that was truly global, truly trustless, uh, and 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 actually really beautiful. Um, and so I said, you know, even if I'm not quite sold on the on the cryptocurrency side of things, I, I, I have to admit that there's something going on in this community, and, and we need to stay close to it. Um, and likewise, uh, Consensus has long been a partner of the Linux Foundation and of Hyperledger. In fact, when I joined, Consensus was a member of Hyperledger. Um, and I know it's been a part of the early conversations about its formation and how to pull things together. And I think we both kind of had to go through our journeys of discovery uh, through those last four years. Um, uh, in, uh, and then in 2019, um, a lot of kind of the diplomacy and groundwork on community building and you know, kind of <clears throat> making sure that this greenhouse model could work uh, really came together, uh, I think, with, um, uh, uh, you know, fi with finally bringing consensus back into the Hyperledger fold and uh, with bringing the um, Enterprise Ethereum Alliance client uh, that uh, uh, consensus had been building on top of uh, uh, on Java and designed to meet enterprise needs, bringing that into Hyperledger as well. So it truly could become a, a global standard for how enterprise Ethereum networks would be built. Um, and that's that's been really exciting. The uh, I, I should mention the the Bezu team, the the team of developers at Pegasus, uh, who are part of the consensus empire. You know, I, I know it's very much a, a spoke kind of model, but uh, um, uh, it's definitely a family. Um, uh, have been just tremendously positive to work with. Um, they got why it was important to build community in this space, why it was important to try to use the same tools as as the other Hyperledger projects, um, and really learn from them on on um, best practices and that sort of thing. And because of that, you know, the, the Bezu community has, has really grown. Um, Bezu is, uh, I, 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 is ver hit version 1.4, um, uh, is being seen in uh, quite a few production networks already today. Um, <clears throat> and, and we're really excited to see that grow as a real complement to the other technology stacks. Um, in some ways, it's a competitor to Fabric. In other ways, it's, it's a competitor in the same way that Postgres and MongoDB are competitors. Um, I, I, you know, they are very different approaches to how you build these centralized systems. Uh, and there's certainly some ways where, um, you know, we're looking at, well, how might they work better together? You know, um, uh, how might there be different standards that help glue these different networks together? And I do believe that most large enterprises will have to exist on both. Um, it would be using both technology domains, be talking to blockchain networks of one flavor or the other out, out in, in the long term. Um, but let's also make sure that we're giving each of these technical communities enough runway uh, to go and make really powerful decisions for themselves about the right way to build things. Um, so we at Hyperledger just want to, you know, be really supportive of the Ethereum community as it figures out how it wants to interface with the enterprise community. Um, Consensus has been a big partner in that. So what I'm excited to do uh, with Joe uh, is explore really how is that playing out? You know, um, how, how, how uh, you know, their view on, on, the, on the enterprise space really has evolved in the last year. Um, uh, really what the, um, how do we really hybridize the, the best of the public blockchain networks or the best of the private blockchain networks? Um, uh, and, and, and maybe get, help you all get a, a feel for where this, this might go down the road. Um, uh, and so with that, I could jump into some questions, but I thought, Joe, I'd, I'd hand the mic over to you just to give a little bit of an intro, if you'd like, on kind of what, uh, what's been going on now at, at, recently at Consensus with uh, uh, your approach to, to thinking about the enterprise um, and, and just a few opening thoughts, and then we can jump into some specific questions. Thanks, Brian. Um, so before jumping into that, I just wanted to first say hi to the Consensus Hong Kong team. Um, I saw them out there and uh, um, they, I think they assisted in setting this up and uh, very good to see them. Um, and also other Consensus um, APAC teams out there. Uh, so Singapore, um, Japan's out there, Australia's out there. Um, so 
Good to see you all. I, as I understand it, there are um, Ethereum meetup groups that were contacted um, from Hong Kong, Singapore, Thailand, uh, maybe some others. Um, and apparently 15,000 people were contacted and uh, I think we caused a, a bit of an overflow. So apologies for that, but I uh, hope lots of you uh, made, it, uh, made it through, made it onto the call. Um, so you're right, Brian, Consensus started as a venture production studio, a hub and spoke model uh, where uh, essentially a year into the onset of the Ethereum project, um, I started Consensus to help build out the platform, help open up an ecosystem. And so we felt the best way to do that is to bring in some of the best technologists and entrepreneurs and let them explore the solution space. And we built lots of great projects, many of which spun out, um, some of which are still inside of Consensus and Consensus has now configured itself to be an integrated software company. So not so much. Uh, consensus proper isn't really that hub and spoke model anymore. Um, we are a bunch of integrated teams all uh, working towards a North Star, which is to build a blockchain operating system. So we have a core stack consisting of Hyperledger Besu at the base, and we commercialize some elements uh, with some tooling called uh, Pegasus Plus. Um, we have Infura, uh, which handles about 10 billion queries per day uh, from the public ecosystem, that's IPFS, uh, as well as Ethereum, uh, different, different networks. So it's reads and writes, the transactions are writes, so the, the reads are other kinds of queries, GraphQL is coming soon. Um, and uh, Infura is soon going to uh, create a federated architecture. Um, so uh, that's going to enable uh, sort of dedicated implementations of Infura so that uh, certain organizations can run their own uh, sort of private infrastructure and connect to, to the public mainnet or, or even their own private infrastructure for, for public networks if they need it. Um, above that, we have uh, lots of different projects for tokenization, document management, uh, uh, legally enforceable agreements. And uh, so that's our um, Codify Commerce and Decentralized Finance Group. Um, MetaMask is a, I think we'll probably talk about it a little bit uh, today, but it's a, a wallet. Uh, it's got a plug-in system. It's uh, um, a major interface to, to our ecosystem for both companies and users. And uh, sort of sitting at the side of all of that is Truffle Suite, which enables uh, uh, individuals, startups, uh, enterprises to develop for private networks or, or public blockchain. And, and let's, let's actually start there a little bit. Let's talk about the kind of the developer experience. I mean, a lot of folks who work with Ethereum and build uh, dApps, right, um, operate very much on the public internet and they can make certain assumptions about services available or, or certain kind of deployment uh, kind of paradigms. How does that change when you're um, talking about permission blockchain networks? Um, and I mean, part of that is just, you know, the different physics of being on a permissioned network, but also what are kind of enterprise expectations for how these apps might work? Uh, how are those different from how somebody building a DeFi app on, on the public uh, Ethereum network? Yeah, so one of the nice things about being in the Ethereum ecosystem is that it doesn't change that much and it's designed that way. Um, it should be a very similar experience to develop a decentralized application. So that's front end uh, and smart contracts on the back end uh, and deploy them to a private permission network or a public permissionless network. Um, so Truffle enables you to easily connect to uh, different kinds of networks. Um, uh, quick quickly shift that around, uh, deploy to your own sandbox, deploy to uh, a test net, deploy, deploy to a private net or, or main net. Um, but there are indeed some differences. Um, so one difference is gas. Uh, you don't have gas accounting or gas dynamics in private networks unless you want to. Uh, it can be really valuable to, to leave that on. On the public main net, uh, we're developing uh, meta transaction solutions so that the developer can handle uh, gas, or gas payments basically, or payments of ether. Um, Security is an, an interesting difference. Uh, so if you're on a private network, um, you don't necessarily need to do any security or, or in Truffle, you can use MythX, uh, which enables you to do dynamic, static, uh, symbolic analyses and take care of your own security. Um, and if you're, that, that's, that may be all you need to do on a private network. If you're deploying uh, something that 
uh, is going to handle high value on a public network, you're probably you're certainly going to want to uh, bring in a, a team to manually audit your smart contracts. And so uh, the way to do that is to set up uh, MythX um, to make it easy and less expensive for an audit team to come in and, and do the work. Uh, we have a group called Consensus Diligence, which is one of the best in the world. And uh, um, the way they suggest that you um, interface with them is bring them in early, uh, let them set you up in the CI, CD, um, show you the design patterns and, and make it uh, uh, a more painless and less expensive process when, when you need to get the final audit done. Yeah, um, it, it, <clears throat> there's probably a dynamic though uh, where when you start one of these permissioned networks, you can, where everybody is knowing who everyone else is who's setting these up, you can be a little less kind of guarded about, you know, sure. having to secure these down. And you perhaps can even know you might be able to take a hard fork if somebody mistakenly, you know, has a bug in a code that allows somebody else to, to, to you know, um, uh, get access to funds they shouldn't have access to, that sort of thing. Um, yeah. uh, there's perhaps a governance model. Um, yeah. But certainly yeah, let, as they, let, let me jump in there. So. So one of the modes of operation is to start um, with a private network with the assumption that you're going to move your application to public. And so we, we've worked with a handful of clients that, uh, uh, that are effectively doing that. So there's one great story where uh, we built an auction platform uh, for the Sacramento Kings the National Basketball NBA Association team. Um, and it's about auctioning off um, game jerseys and, and other equipment. And so the first auction that uh, that ran, um, their star player, Buddy Heald, uh, had his jersey auctioned off. And virtually immediately we were contacted and, and they, they suggested, or they, they did it on a private network, a private Ethereum network, because they just wanted to be careful and prudent about uh, the launch of the thing. Um, and we got a call or an email from the, the guy who won the auction. Um, and he basically said, uh, how do I get my token on public Ethereum? Uh, so mm -hmm. the token is there, it's an NFT, a non-fungible token, and it acts as a certificate of authenticity. The trainers take photographs and et cetera, and they, they ship the token along with the, uh, the uh, jersey itself. Um, and he basically um, wanted to know what happens if the network ends, what if the, the Kings decide not to continue that project um, and oh, by the way, uh, he wants to trade that token at some point, or he wants right. to trade the shirt at some point in the future. And who's going to buy that shirt uh, if the certificate of authenticity doesn't accompany it? Uh, and so yeah. he needed it on public blockchain. And, and so we got that done. Yeah, the idea of permission networks as kind of training wheels uh, yeah. for what eventually yeah. become public network apps is definitely interesting. I mean, I think for some enterprises and some use cases, you know, the the advantage of a permission blockchain will also be in, you know, kind of data locality, right? You know, I, I you know, I know where the servers are ge either geographically or organizationally, and and you know, that's always an extra layer of security. Um, I, you know, also the ability to kind of require a hard fork by a regulator or something like that. Might also uh, be interesting. Um, I, I, at least, at least for now, it's, it's possible that you know we can get those same kind of regulatory oversight functions implemented as smart contract functions rather than as you know control sure. of the nodes um, in the long term. But I think helping people understand you know, kind of the safe space that they can experiment with this. Um, but I'm curious about that transition from like a, a 10 company network to like a 200 company network, where at the 10 company, you can physically gather everybody in a room, sit them around a table, have them all sign a terms of service and look each other in the eye and say, okay, we'll, we'll figure this out together as we go. But when you've got 200 different entities on, on the network and they all want to stand up a peer, um, it's much harder to get that kind of universal trust in, and in fact, this is technology to, to be able to supplant that kind of trust, you know, or to, to trust in the system rather than having to put trust in the individuals. Uh, but uh, but the it's, not, right. it's not just the governance. It's actually uh, having more than 100 independent nodes on, on certain networks in certain protocols um, is not doable. Uh, yeah. So the, the, the Ethereum technology and the Bitcoin technology have, have demonstrated you can have tens of thousands. Um, yeah. Or you have to proxy that trust into a small number of nodes, right? You know, yeah, rather, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I uh, know that's, that's all fascinating. So um, uh, what are some examples of folks using Bezu out there at, at, at any scale, right? Um, you know, but uh, how, how much of, a, of an actual real world workout is it, is it getting? 
Um, so I think we've seen um, around 60 organizations. So Bezu is a little bit young. Um, uh, other projects like Quorum um, that JP Morgan built on, on the Ethereum Go technology um, are older and more established. Uh, uh, we expect, that, so it's open source, so we, we expect that there are uh, probably 100 or 200 projects out there that are using Besu or experimenting with Besu. Um, and probably significantly more than that um, for JP Morgan's Quorum. Uh, they're very similar clients. Um, uh, main difference is that uh, our base layer, uh, Basu, which connects to uh, public Ethereum or can be uh, used in private contexts, uh, is Java and Apache 2. Um, JP Morgan's is the Go, uh, Golang Ethereum client and uh, uh, GPL, uh, GPL v3. Um, and so some organizations will be more comfortable with the, uh, with the less restrictive uh, Apache license. Um, and both of us have built uh, a confidential confidentiality overlay layer uh, to enable groups to uh, have confidential transactions or su subsets of the users on, on the network can speak to one another, do transactions among one another and not leak information to others that, that aren't uh, part of uh, uh, those groups. And so we're moving towards uh, enabling, so our, our teams are working very closely together uh, on a handful of different elements. Uh, so consensus and um, authentication permissioning systems, um, and just trying to get them to the point where they are uh, plug and play compatible, uh, perfectly plug and play compatible and uh, both conforming to the enterprise Ethereum Alliance uh, specification. Right, right. Um, I'll come back to the production networks or users question in the future, but this is this is really interesting. So um, uh, for those of you who might not know, um, the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance, uh, the EEA uh, is a standards organization out there. Uh, I guess they were really formed uh, to solve initially just this one problem, right? Which is if you're building enterprise Ethereum networks, you know, using the technology that works really well on the mainnet, um, uh, there's some additional requirements, right? And you were no, presuming that there will be multiple clients out there, which there are, and I think is a healthy thing. Um, how do you guarantee that those different clients uh, stay in sync from a from a uh, future perspective, much in the way that the public mainnet ones do, but but in a, a standards process that perhaps enterprises are more comfortable with, right? Yeah. Um, so that that uh, the EEA they released the the 1.0 client spec what early last year. Um, I, I think we're roughly timing and um, yeah, many blocks ago. Yeah. yeah. And Quorum and Bezu, I guess, are the two main EEA clients, right? Yeah, there are um, a handful of others. Yeah. 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 So so down the road, we won't necessarily be talking about, oh, that's a Quorum network or that's a Bezu network. It'll just be that's an EEA spec network and Quorum and, and Bezu can be interoperable on that. That would be at least the goal, right? In the long yeah. term. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it, how how close do you think efforts are to that goal? Um, I mean, uh, I, we're we're zeroing in on it. Uh, so um, we have good reasons to to make our clients uh, interoperate really soon because um, our teams are are working together increasingly closely. Um, and one of the next steps is for us to uh, move away from our Orion confidentiality overlay and implement their Tessera confidentiality overlay on top of that. And, and the other pieces like uh, consensus and, and others are uh, also um, in progress. And so um, the, we've been supporting Quorum for a long time. Our customer success and support group, uh, I think it's about two and a half, three years old. Uh, we hired uh, a uh, spectacular gentleman who ran HP Enterprises uh, Customer Success Group because uh, we we uh, needed to build a, a support function for our enterprise consortia projects and also for projects like MetaMask and we, we knew Basu was coming up. Uh, and so we've been doing it for quite a while and initially we were supporting Quorum because we built uh, the ComGo Commodity Trade Finance Network with a bunch of banks and energy companies and more recently are building Covantis with uh, some of the biggest uh, uh, food commodity companies in the world. And uh, those um, are, are both Quorum, uh, may move to having Besu on the network or, or moving to Besu totally at some point, uh, TBD. Um, 
Uh, there, there are some projects that are currently that started on Besu. Uh, so there are two nation state networks, um, one called Elastria uh, and one called LAC chain, L Latin America chain. Um, so they're building that out. And we, um, there's a, a project in South Africa uh, called uh, Zarex. It's like a, it's like a fund structure project that we didn't even know about it. Um, so it, uh, we, we found out about it when it launched. Yeah, I mean, that's when you know you're successful in open source. When um, yeah. I remember in the early days of the Apache web server, when we realized that both right. the Vatican and the FBI were running Apache, and we figured wow. we had the full gamut there. Yep. Of, uh, whole world. <laughs> <laughs> um, indeed. Uh, um, so how about uh, progress on um, kind of the commercial hosting services out there, um, uh, providing Bezu as a managed service and, and kind of the professionalization, if you will, of that space? I mean, how many, how many options do people have out there for kind of picking a vendor and, and working with them? Um, so uh, Google Cloud, or at least Google Cloud APAC, I believe, um, has Besu available uh, in the Google Cloud Marketplace. Um, Ocean, or uh, I think it's pronounced O-C-Y-A-N, um, has it available. Um, uh, we're working really closely uh, with Microsoft Azure. Uh, I think it may be available um, now and uh, uh, we're working on um, a deeper availability uh, with them. Cool. So, so look for and, that. And uh, Kaleido, of course, right? Yeah, so Kaleido's, uh, um, it's a different project. It's, uh, it's a way to, um, it, it's definitely blockchain as a service uh, and it's a, uh, a much more managed, opinionated architecture uh, where it's really easy to just type in some email addresses and uh, configure your network. You can uh, set up the number of nodes that you want, uh, connectivity, permissions, uh, geos. Uh, it is multi-cloud um, and um, it's a, a really easy way to, to get started uh, uh, with your blockchain network. Okay. Um, when people come, when, when companies come to you and say, you know, we're, we're interested in all this stuff, but we're really concerned about blockchain interoperability. Um, uh, you know, I, 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 I have my take when I, when I hear those words um, uh, and, and kind of play it out. It, oftentimes people will kind of wrap that into four or five different concepts. Um, but um, certainly I, I hear a desire out there amongst uh, um, enterprises to, to uh, say, you know, we want you technologists to figure it out so we don't um, ever get penalized for making a wrong decision, right? Um, <laughs> you know, and we're not buying into to just one solution or another that we've got something that's interoperable. Um, yep. Certainly EEA is a big part of that yeah. interoperability story. Um, mm -hmm. And I've liked actually some of the additional standards that have come out, the token taxonomy framework, um, uh, the uh, secure computing um, initiative as well, that actually is a part of Hyperledger Avalon. Um, uh, and actually on the token taxonomy front, um, you might have heard about this. We've got a, a lab in Hyperledger Labs called eThaler, which is uh, an implementation of the TTF for, uh, for a central bank digital currency. Um, uh, it's something yeah, that I did, people I did are heard about that. doing it as an experiment, um, but it's starting to get some traction, so it could be crazy. Um, uh, but back to this bigger picture of interoperability, what, what do you think are the things that we're not yet focused on that we should be focusing on um, when it comes to, to interop between, between the different blockchain networks out there. Um, uh, presuming there is no one chain to rule them all or even one protocol to rule them all. Um, what are the most interesting projects that either, either are out there and we should pay more attention to or somebody needs to do? Yeah, so um, we, we certainly believe for a long time that uh, the increasingly decentralized World Wide Web will incorporate lots of decentralized protocols that will interoperate with one another. So it's not just blockchain networks, it's uh, uh, decentralized storage networks and decentralized bandwidth and heavy compute and identity and proof of location, et cetera. Um, and uh, so certainly lots of blockchains will need to connect to one another in different ways to move tokens around or uh, validate transactions or execute transactions uh, across uh, network boundaries. Um, it's easy for Ethereum networks to do that. Uh, same format transactions, uh, you know, the, the wallets, um, I'll talk to different networks, et cetera. Um, and we are hearing more and more interest in connecting 
uh, heterogeneous architectures together. So fabric uh, to Ethereum or Chinese uh, blockchain network architectures to, to other networks. Um, um, Congo um, connected to VACT, uh, so commodity trading to commodity trade finance. Uh, so those were both uh, Ethereum architectures. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's simply going to be um, necessary uh, for lots of different networks to, to connect to one another. And uh, uh, so far, we, we wanted to do a, a bunch of projects, but uh, uh, limited time, resources, et cetera, um, we really need uh, uh, some commercial opportunities to drive that. And, and some of those are emerging. So um, there has been interest that we've become aware of um, in different kinds of organizations in different countries, Asian or, or not, uh, to connect to the Chinese networks. Um, and there's concern there uh, that, uh, yes, they want to be part of that uh, business network infrastructure, um, but, you know, the, the whole ethos of blockchain is, is trustlessness, right? Um, you don't really want a central authority to control and possibly manipulate uh, the data on a network. And so um, it'd be nice if there was a way to move data between networks and call different processes on different networks and be on your network and know that it is um, controlled by people that you know or um, perhaps uh, very decentralized and permissionless and, and uh, has more trust characteristics. And so, so we anticipate that there will be good reasons uh, to, to see connectivity across the network protocols there. there there's one other major development um, that I'm excited to, to talk about. Uh, I, I know you're aware of it. Uh, it's called the baseline protocol. Um, so baseline protocol was developed by Ernst & Young uh, and a company called Consensus, uh, and uh, somewhat supported uh, by our friends at Microsoft. Uh, so we worked together with Ernst & Young. Uh, Paul Brody drove that project uh, to basically create a protocol that operates on public mainnet Ethereum uh, that can connect uh, different blockchain architectures or just different systems, different uh, um, systems of record uh, inside organizations so that they can link agreements across a bunch of different counterparties or link business processes um, without leaking any information. Uh, and so the reason they don't leak information onto a public network is because they're not putting any of their information on public Ethereum. What they're doing um, is creating zero knowledge proofs and essentially entangling private information on their own systems behind their own firewalls and, and just proving that those agreements or those business processes are perfectly in sync. And so mm -hmm. um, they built a procurement network, which is a, a first example. And I, I think we're going to see uh, this technology link lots of different blockchain systems and other systems, uh, essentially using public Ethereum as a, a middleware bus uh, for data yeah. processes. It's something we're following for sure. And is there is there something in Ethereum 2.0 in the kind of emerging changes to to kind of the layer one and 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 the re, re, reformed architecture that you think will have um, uh, benefits for um, kind of the enterprise blockchain side, or is that really intended to benefit kind of more the public chain? And I mean, do you see anything carrying over as a benefit to the kind of permission deployments? Yeah. So we've always had this thesis of convergence, and so. Um, we think less about uh, um, the vast differences between public chain and enterprise usage. Um, um, so is there something in Ethereum 2 uh, that is more enterprise friendly? Uh, yes, it'll be scalability, better privacy and confidentiality, better usability, um, just like the internet, you've heard this many times. Uh, in the 90s, lots of organizations wanted to use the web protocols, uh, but uh, were scared of the uh, big bad internet, public internet, because it wasn't secure, or private or confidential, hard to use, et cetera. And so they would set up um, HTTP and email protocols on their uh, intranets. And uh, that phenomenon is being 
um, repeated with the use of intranets. And uh, we're going to see as the, the public blockchain technology gets more and more sophisticated, uh, more and more usable, secure, scalable, etc. cetera, um, we're going to see private permission systems executed on public mainnet blockchains. Uh, and so um, absolutely, Ethereum 2, uh, happy to talk about uh, the transition from Ethereum 1 and Ethereum 2. If you want to go deep down that rabbit hole, I, I enjoy talking about that. Uh, but but it, it'll certainly um, bring many more enterprises uh, into that public um, blockchain world. Mm. So probably, you know, also by helping with scalability, you know, for some people's uh, worries at ease about, um, you know, sure. contention for the 15 transactions per second or whatever. So, uh, like. so yeah, that that's true. But uh, Ethereum um, is all, Ethereum one is already seeing quite a lot of scalability. Uh, so there are uh, technologies like state channels that uh, are effectively infinite transactions per second happening off chain and getting settled on chain. That technology is maturing very rapidly. Um, there are roll-up techniques. Um, there's optimistic roll-ups. Uh, there's zero knowledge roll-ups. And um, I think uh, Starkware demonstrated 9,000 transactions per second that basically settle in one transaction on or two transactions on on mainnet Ethereum, and so we're going to be able to, uh, you know, for DeFi applications and gaming applications, we're going to be able to do uh, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of transactions per second that are are anchored on Ethereum one, um, and when we multiply that by five hundred or a thousand, um, moving to Ethereum two as a base layer, um, mm -hmm. and we'll still use that layer two architecture to achieve real scalability. Um, but uh, uh, it starts to get uh, much, much better on Ethereum too. Mm -hmm. um, shifting gears a little bit, I, I, when we think about um, some of the, the, the examples of the networks out there using, whether it's Quorum or, or Bezu, um, uh, you know, using enterprise Ethereum technologies, uh, you know, I'm sure there's concerns by regulators, concerns by some of the more conservative organizations um, about, you know, not only the idea of using enterprise blockchain tech, but, but you know, kind of the, um, the kind of cryptocurrency origins of the technology. Um, but it's also been encouraging to see folks get kind of past that too. Um, what are some of the biggest wins you, you have, you can think of recently in terms of brands, in terms of kind of, um, you know, even if it's projects that are still just in pilot, you know, companies that are willing to kind of, you know, give this, give this a, a, a drive. I mean, you mentioned Comgo and some other, and, uh, um, uh, and some others, but um, what are some of the companies involved in those and, and how deep do you see them getting? Into the, into the technology? So the biggest win uh, in using Ethereum for private networks or the public network? Private networks. Oh, for private permission, networks. Permissioned or, or yeah. Yeah, so um, there's a lot out there. Um, I can give you uh, a small number that, uh, that we're very aware of. Um, so there's uh, the Covantis project, uh, which is, uh, as I said before, it's Cargill, it's ADM, it's Bungie, uh, it's Louis Dreyfus. Uh, basically, the the biggest food um, com commodity uh, traders, uh, shippers in the world, um, and um, I, I think they handle eighty percent of the world's uh, food mm -hmm. transportation. Um, uh, it looks like the project's going to go live in a, a very small number of months uh, with uh, the founding. Uh, companies and uh, there are a bunch more companies that uh, have actually uh, signed up, and so there will be a bigger release uh, later this year. Uh, so That's it's cool to hear uh, Cargill, Cargill mentioned there because Cargill is a member of Hyperledger. They uh, mm -hmm. have also participated in the Sawtooth project, yep. um, uh, even more heavily in Hyperledger Grid. Uh, yep. You know, and and then we saw an announcement a few weeks ago where they launched a, a fabric-based network too. So I think they're actually an example, to me at least, of the kind of you know blue chip you know company. You don't think of them as a technology company, but 
of yeah. where uh, these companies are realizing that, you know, this is going to be core to their business and they need to be kind of hands on with evaluating and trying things out and being a part of co-creating the underlying technology, not just yeah. buying it as a black box from somebody else. So uh, really cool to hear about, about them taking a leadership on this. Uh, Walmart is another example of sure. a company that, um, you know, has been experimenting with blockchain technology for a few years, kind of quietly. They also recently just joined Hyperledger. They're also kind of deep in on uh, the food trust network, but also doing other other projects uh, on the supply chain side. So, yeah. so that's cool. What about um, some of the financial use cases? Because um, uh, one of the things that I think really shines about about Bezu and the Ethereum underpinning—I mean, it sounds obvious—but is the, the the token oriented nature of it uh, actually maps really well to marketplaces, to to you know other places where um, non -fung fungible or not, you know, these kinds of units of account being moved around. Um, I, 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 is a is like the core use case. Um, uh, can you speak to any of the kind of financial markets kind of uses for for um, either enterprise Ethereum or or even some of the stuff that is enterprise sure. use of the the public blockchain? I get you kind of most yeah. excited. I, I don't have to go too far. Uh, our friends at J.P. Morgan uh, have built something called the Interbank Information Network, which uh, currently has uh, about four hundred. Um, international financial institutions signed on to it. Uh, uh, it's a SWIFT-like payments network. Um, mm -hmm. And they're building a different project, uh, a JPM coin, um, that uh, is essentially going to enable uh, their internal customers uh, to move tokens of value uh, rather than um, actual money uh, between different accounts. Um, uh, Signature Bank has built something very similar, and there, there are other institutions uh, that are building that. Um, uh, so, going back to that baseline project, uh, Ernst and Young created this um, procurement system uh, that enables lots of counterparties to enter into procurement networks and tokenize um, the money used on the system. So stable coins uh, for payment uh, tokenize merchandise being traded on the network, tokenize invoices so they can factor um, payments. Um, and all of this is done in zero knowledge uh, using zero knowledge proofs. And so all of it is shielded and it's all, all totally compartmentalized. So um, if you got uh, um, and suppliers, they can't really figure out that they're all supplying the same uh, entity. Uh, they don't know what the different prices are. Uh, so uh, it's a pretty remarkable system. And um, the tokenization um, makes it all very financial, obviously. And it connects it to uh, the DeFi world, the decentralized finance world. And so um, it is anticipated that uh, these tokens of value will uh, be able to participate in lending borrowing networks and automated portfolio management and insurance systems that are all being built out right, right now as the, um, what I like to think of as the decentralized financial plumbing layer of the emerging decentralized economy. Yeah. Well, and, and then kind of the granddaddy of use cases in, in all this, I think, uh, and the one I know you guys have spent some time focusing on is central bank digital currencies. Um, sure. uh, I think uh, a lot of people were spurred into action last year by uh, Libra and by, um, you know, the uh, word from China that they were developing one. Um, you know, I, I know China has been moving forward. I don't know that any of us have technical details yet on, on uh, what, what platform they're using, but um, can you share some of the research work uh, and perhaps even, you know, stuff in pilot you might have around um, CBDCs uh, and the use uh, of Ethereum pr permissioned or, or public? Yeah, we, we've done some um, good thinking uh, about uh, CBDCs. Um, uh, we have spoken with central banks around the world and uh, uh, there's some uh, interesting projects out there. There's one in the Eastern Caribbean uh, that our friends at BITTTBIT.com um, have uh, put together. It's in pilot right now. Um, uh, South Africa, certainly China, the U.S. is getting very active uh, in um, contemplating uh, that sort of use case. Um, so uh, without sharing too much detail, um, I, I can say that uh, it's turning into a real race and, and uh, COVID has really activated things. Um, probably Libra 
uh, got things started. The Libra project seemed to panic uh, um, the Chinese central bank and cause them to, so they, they were already um, very sophisticated, probably three or four years ago. Um, we had some people speak with them and uh, they knew the technology pretty well. And so um, it's not a surprise if they come out with something uh, pretty soon. Um, and uh, I, I think it's going to be a, a very interesting race. Um, uh, currently, uh, the United States Federal Reserve note, uh, a paper token, is uh, the world's reserve currency, dominant reserve currency. I think it's around 61%. The euro is maybe around 20%. Um, and the next battlefield is um, going to be fought um, in the digital space uh, for reserve currency status. And um, it's going to be about um, privacy, confidentiality, um, censorship, um, rule of law. Uh, it's going to be about uh, how freely you can move how much money. Um, so are there going to be maxes that, uh, um, that you can send uh, without uh, some sort of control? Um, are you going to be able to uh, send money peer to peer uh, without interference, without owning an account? Um, so the, these are the kinds of issues that, uh, that all of these organizations are, are wrestling with right now or, or designing to. Well, it seems pretty clear to me that, you know, it's straightforward to use a, a distributed ledger um, uh, as, as the mechanism for kind of uh, gross settlement between banks, right? Between a central bank and the tier one banks inside of any country, or even between the central banks of different countries, kind of, you know, like what the Bureau of International Settlements does, that sort of thing. Sure. Um, I, what, what I think is unclear to me is whether we have the technology today or in the next two couple of years to be able to do retail payments, you know, at the same yeah. you know granular granularity and low cost and most importantly privacy preservation that working with real cash gives you right yeah. and i think you know today you buy a stick of gum with ethereum or bitcoin that's traceable to everything it's just by uh, by default right like the the pieces they feel like they're coming into place there's still a lot of hard work to do to ubiquitously get zero knowledge um yeah. uh systems in, in, in implemented enough um do you feel there's there's like a breakthrough on the horizon on that front or is that is this kind of a hard slog to, to, to just, you know, get, get some prosaic stuff implemented over the next few years. Yeah, so we, we built a couple of those RTGS systems, the, the real-time gross settlement systems. We did one in the context of, uh, of the um, uh, Monetary Authority of Singapore um, and one uh, in South Africa with the Reserve Bank there. Um, and yeah, it, uh, so it worked uh, relatively quickly, but it's uh, certainly sort of wholesale and uh, um, nowhere near uh, what uh, needs to be in place uh, with respect to scalability for a retail architecture, even, even for a small nation. Um, we have an architecture on paper um, that is Ethereum based that would enable smart contracts to operate on, on an Ethereum based private network um, that would uh, use a layer two scalability architecture plus uh, state channels uh, to uh, enable very, very impressive scalability. Um, it works perfectly well on paper um, and uh, <laughs> uh, we, we're showing it around. So uh, uh, Good. I, I'm Good. sure there will be um, lots of issues in trying to implement something like that. But uh, theoretically, uh, if, uh, if there was an Apollo project and we had to build it, I'm, I'm pretty confident we could get uh, um, very impressive scalability. Okay. Well, I, I'm keeping my eyes on the Q&A. So I've been trying to work in some of the themes that, that the questions have been touching on, as well as the questions that we collected during the registration phase. Um, uh, so hopefully many of the folks in the audience have been heard, heard their questions kind of answered in bits and pieces here. I think the big topic, of course, of the, of the year is COVID-19. Um, and uh, I was wondering if, if uh, you could give your kind of take on where you think blockchain technology might be appropriate in addressing some of these issues that we have um, uh, in front of us. I, I'm, always, I'm always personally very worried about saying I've got a hammer and everything's a nail, um, mm -hmm. but it's even occurred to me that there are some, some even short-term places where it could be useful. But I was wondering if I get your take first, perhaps even you know, if you're working on anything in that area, kind of a hint, a hint towards that. Sure. So. 
In terms of use cases, there, there are a handful of things. So there, there is the interest in, in digital currencies. Um, uh, there is uh, decentralized identity and verifiable credentials. Um, we have a project called Uport that implements uh, uh, hopefully globally uh, interoperable specifications when it all gets worked out. Uh, that, that's what we're um, shooting for. Um, and that architecture uh, is being proposed uh, for an antibody or immunity uh, identity system uh, for a major national health service. Um, so um, big application. Um, more philosophically, um, I think COVID, uh, as awful as it is, may represent an inflection point in in how the world operates. Uh, so I am not optimistic that uh, the global economy is going to recover uh, anytime soon or look much like it did before. Uh, I think uh, uh, this is a profound uh, irreversible change and um, patterns of our lives are, are gonna get different and um, it may end up being an opportunity to build um, better architectures that serve, uh, you know, for global systems that serve people better and small organizations better and uh, build, enable us to build with, with better trust. Uh, and so um, for that reason, I'm looking forward to, um, I guess, the opportunity to re-architect some systems, uh, hopefully uh, um, just the fact that we have uh, many uh, social systems, social welfare systems around the world that are much more sophisticated and uh, better safety nets than we've had in previous major global crises. Uh, hopefully it can be relatively smooth and uh, the fact that uh, money now grows on trees and rains from the skies. Um, money for to go burr. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, maybe um, we'll be able to use uh, some of that to re-architect uh, new better systems. I, I hope so, for sure. I, I mean, uh, it's been shown after, you know, major pandemics in history, uh, you often see economic systems dramatically change. Sometimes you see the design of cities change. You see the rise of public health authorities. You see the rise and, and, and sanitation standards. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a time for reflection and a bit of a time for a reboot. Um, I, 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 I find myself focused not so much on the, the this week horizon of getting masks and PPEs and ventilators to people, though I know some people looking at supply chain issues with that, um, or necessarily the very long-term future, people like you or yeah. Ty Tyler Cohen and, and others who are thinking about this um, picture. I'm a bit more focused on like the two month to, to two year kind of picture. You know, Vaccines as they come out, it'd be very hard to get to everybody uh, okay. uh, on the first day. So how do, you, how do you just amp up the supply chains for those, but then also allow those who have received the vaccine to be able to go back to work uh, and, and prove that you know, they're clear to, clear to work or clear to travel, that sort of thing. Lots of yeah. big, hard, but, let, let me jump in. I, I've got to, got to mention one project that uh, sure. a couple of uh, uh, people inside a consensus took on spontaneously. So um, two individuals, Evan and Jen, um, were aware that uh, uh, different uh, frontline personnel in hospitals and fire departments uh, were having trouble uh, sourcing personal protective equipment. And they just went to work, they didn't tell anybody, uh, they started calling around, they found uh, sources in mainland China, they found a group in Hong Kong uh, that would help them. Um, and they used our Trium track and trace uh, uh, supply chain system to uh, basically uh, log uh, the products into that system. Uh, so there, there were issues with trusting um, the products and trusting the, the trend, uh, uh, shipping and are trying to figure out how to get the payments uh, there faster. And guess what? Cryptocurrencies move pretty quickly around the world. So uh, uh, we're, we're working to make that part of the system. So uh, quite spontaneously, a few weeks ago, um, these two individuals uh, put a system together and uh, have been delivering PPE to um, different groups in the U.S.
that's fantastic. Um, uh, it's the digital payment. It's also kind of the know your supplier, trust your supplier kind of uh, yeah. kind of use case, right? You know, understanding, uh, you know, where again, digital reputation, digital identity is yeah. very important. Um, I think there might also end up being a, a use case around contact tracing and the far off kind of uh, sure. uh, uh, thing. It's uh, uh, there's some real challenges there with just managing decentralized information. That, yeah, that I, I think. So an incredibly enabling technology, also a very scary technology. Um, so uh, we, yeah, and, we need and to be no very magic. vigilant that, uh, uh, that, this, that this sort of granular uh, invasive cracking doesn't uh, persist uh, beyond uh, when it's necessary and doesn't right. fall into the wrong hands. No, trust me, it's that's on my mind too. Um, I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I do want to thank you so much um, uh, for, for staying up late. Uh, this has been a great conversation. Um, Hyperledger Bezu is really just a really fun project to have inside. I really encourage everyone out there uh, to take a look at it on the Hyperledger website and the wiki, join the mailing list, join the phone calls, um, uh, try, you know, get started with it. Um, you'll be seeing a lot more this year from us on that as well. We'll start, um, we're looking right now at doing the training program that we do kind of for Fabric, also doing that for, for Bezu. Uh, lots of places where I think that's going to really grow to be a major platform for us. Um, and it's really tremendous thanks to Consensus and to the Ethereum community for um, believing in the enterprise use cases uh, and the need to bring everybody along in this revolution. Um, uh, and again, thank you, Joe, and to everybody who attended for, for participating from wherever time zone you're in um cool. and thanks for that uh, thanks everyone oh, yep okay uh, uh we'll wrap up thank you thank you everyone have a good night <laughs>